welcome to this new edition of Over the White Line, brought to you by BritsOnPole.com and the number two. Two being the number of major championships that have wrapped up since our last edition, with Sebastian Vettel winning in Formula One and Scott Dixon in IndyCars. And two is also the number of prodigal sons returning home, with Kimi Raikkonen coming back to Ferrari and Juan Pablo Montoya announcing his return to IndyCars from NASCAR. Two is also the number of uh, motorsport-themed movies that really get what racing is all about uh, that have come out this year with the addition of Turbo, the Indy 500-themed cartoon. Two is also the number of knees I've had operated on since uh, our last edition. Mm, sexy. And two is also the number of drivers who went into the final GP2 weekend in Abu Dhabi with a realistic chance of the title. And unfortunately, the one we've got in an interview with later in this edition, Sam Bird, is not the one who won it. Sadly, two is also the number of British IndyCar drivers who suffered serious injuries in high-speed crashes, Dario Franchitti in Houston and Justin Wilson in Fontana, and we send our best wishes to both of them in their recovery. And also, two, most dreadfully, is the number of driver deaths we've had with the loss of Maria de Valota and Sean Edwards. Now, de Valota may not have been the fastest driver ever to strap herself into an F1 car, but the courage with which she came back from her dreadful uh, Duxford accident is an inspiration. And Edwards... Well, he may just have a claim to be the best British driver you've never heard of. And we'll see that later when we look at the current BRDC Gold Star rankings, which uh, rates all the British drivers currently in competition. As well as that, and the interview with Sam, we'll be hearing from Duncan Tappy, who is going to be joining us, we hope, on a regular basis as a contributor, but this today we'll introduce him to you. And also, um, to start with, Jerry Parker will tell you about why a racing car is currently in an art exhibition. Ask a room full of motorsport fans what the best looking F1 car was and you'll get a room full of opinions. The Lotus 25 or the 49? The 7-Up Jordan? Dan Gurney's Eagle Mark 1? Or Senna's McLaren MP45? Any fan will tell you a well-designed F1 car can be a work of art. Well, one world-famous gallery has taken that to its logical extreme and is showing one of the all-time great cars as part of an exhibition simply called Masterpieces. The Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts at Norwich's University of East Anglia is staging the exhibition as part of the uni's 50th anniversary celebrations with the aim of showcasing the greatest artistic, cultural and practical achievements of the East Anglian region over the last millennia and beyond. There's Saxon and Roman treasure, Fabergé miniatures, paintings by masters such as Turner, Gainsborough and Holbein and a Lotus Type 72. Designed by Colin Chapman and Maurice Philippe, driven by Ronnie Peterson, owned now by classic Team Lotus. There's no doubt that Lotus is one of the great Norfolk names, so it qualifies on geography, and the Type 72 was a revelation when it made its debut in 1970. It raced for six years, its drivers scored victories in four of them, and it won the Constructors' title three times. But is it art? Sainsbury Centre director Paul Greenarch is certain it is. He said... This exhibition dips back through thousands of years and comes right up to the present day. It assembles the very greatest collection of works of art based purely on the idea that they are masterpieces of their kind. You won't find many F1 fans arguing with him, but to help you make up your mind, Classic Team Lotus has also loaned plans of the car and supplied three films about the history of Lotus and its cars. The exhibition runs until 24th of February and costs £8 for adults or £20 for a family ticket. The Type 72, however, is one of three items shown separately from the rest of the exhibition. You'll find it in the cafe, which is free to enter. Thank you, Jerry. And now, five quick questions for Duncan Tappy. Hi, everybody. I'm Duncan Tappy. I'm a racing driver from the UK. I'm currently racing a McLaren MP4 12C in the British GT Championship. Question one, how did you first get noticed as a racer? My first proper season uh, racing, racing single seaters was, was the Formula Ford UK Championship. I actually won 10 out of the 20 races that year and then went on to win the very prestigious Formula Ford Festival. So to have my name up against the likes of Jensen Button, Mark Webber and people like that was really what put my, my name on the, on the map, really. Question two. What is your greatest achievement so far? My next success after that was being uh, the British champion in the Formula, Formula Renault. Again, 
my name was up against uh, names of Kimi Räikkönen and Lewis Hamilton. Uh, so yeah, that meant a lot to me and, and it's probably my biggest uh, success to date. Question three. Where are you racing this season? As I've already mentioned, this year I'm racing in the British GT Championship with Von Ryan Racing in the McLaren again, so uh, I know the car. We had a third at Snetterton and at the last round at Brands Hatch we had a second. The only issue is we are carrying the 75 kilo of ballast, so it's a little bit tough at times, but we're, uh, we're working very, very well together. It will be interesting to see how the rest of the season goes, and uh, I really can't wait to, to see how that ends up. Question four. You just earned your 47th podium in car racing. Did it mean as much to you as the first? I think the, the podiums in British GT this year have, have meant almost almost probably more than, than, than others um, because we are, as, I, as I've mentioned, we're, we're carrying that 75 kilos. So for, for myself, when I'm up against the other pros in my stints in, in the races, to, to hold my position against the other pros is, is, is something I, I, I can really be proud of. Question five. Talking of handicaps, didn't you just beat Damon Hill at golf? Yes, yes, that is true. I, I did beat Damon Hill at golf not so long ago. Um, I'm a massively keen golfer. I think uh, quite a few racing drivers are. It's a, it's a nice getaway, relax. Um, maybe not so relaxing sometimes. It can be a very, very frustrating sport. It's, it's always good to, to get away and, and chill out with golf and hopefully I'll get a few more chances to, to beat him again soon. Duncan is someone who's built up a wealth of experience in motorsports, both as a championship winning racing driver and also as a much in demand racing coach. And he's going to be dropping by to talk us through some of the aspects of racing that you might not know about as a fan and you might never see. And he's already shot his piece for our next edition and here's a sneak preview of it. Well hi everybody, I'm here today to talk you through all the race equipment that us racing drivers wear every time we step foot into a car. You've uh, all seen it on TV, but I'm sure most of you don't actually know the amount of detail that goes into these specialised pieces of kit. So that's what we've got to look forward to next time out. But now we go back to Jerry Parker, who's going to talk us through the current British Racing Drivers Club Gold Star standings. Back when BritsOnPole.com was still running as a regular website, we used to do a feature we called the All-Star League, where we tried to rank all the British drivers racing in single-seaters based on their results. It was kind of fun to do, if a little predictable in outcome. Dario Franchitti won it in 2009, and again in 2010, and he was leading when we shut up shop in 2011. When we relaunched Brits on Pole as this video magazine, we thought about reviving the All-Star League, but there were some problems. For one thing, it was only for single-seat drivers, and this new-look Brits on Pole ranges more widely than that. As well as that, it was a lot of work to maintain. A very lot of work. Seriously, we're not kidding about the work. You try weighing up who deserved more points. A driver who loses, but finishes narrowly behind legends like Alonso and Raikkonen, or one who annihilates a field full of milk float drivers in some junior formula no one's ever heard of. But then we realised, why do we need to reinvent it when the British Racing Drivers Club is already doing something far better in its gold star standings? The stars are the awards of merit handed out each season by the club, and to track where they should go, it calculates who is doing best throughout the season. Now, at this point, we have to say we're not in any way pretending to be endorsed or approved by the BRDC. We're just reporting their numbers. But they're good numbers, covering the Brits and a few honorary overseas members in just about every series on four wheels. So, who's leading? Based on the 31st October standings, it's a real mix. 2011 and 2012 Gold Star winner Rob Huff is in fifth. Fourth is Alexander Sims, and in third is honorary Brit and proud Aussie Mark Webber. Frank Eaty doesn't even make the top ten, and nor does Jensen Button, because the top two are Sean Edwards in second and Lewis Hamilton first. Edwards, as we said at the top of the show, was killed recently in an accident at Queensland Raceway in Australia. He was 26 and, at the time, the leader in the Porsche Super Cup. He'd also won the Nürburgring 24 hours and played his father, F1 driver Guy Edwards, in the movie Rush. He was a very long way away from being a household name and most casual fans of the sport wouldn't have known much, if anything, about him. But the numbers don't lie and they show we lost an unsung but very real talent when he died. Thank you for that, Jerry, and I hope we're going to be able to continue to update you on the Gold Star standings right through to the end of the season. 
Now those statistics didn't include the weekend of November the 2nd and 3rd, which is when we're filming this. That means they leave out some of the drivers in action that weekend, such as Lewis Hamilton, Alexander Sims or Sam Bird. Sam, of course, was challenging for the GP2 championship that weekend, although it didn't work out for him. But earlier in the week, Brits on Pole's David Ironmonger caught up with him with this interview. So before the season, where were you personally expecting to be? I mean, did you have belief in yourself that you could, could win? It's, it's crazy. Before, before the, uh, the season started, I mean, I was going to Australia with with Mercedes not knowing what I was going to drive I found out on the Saturday evening when I was in Australia for the for the first Grand Prix of the year that I would be taking part in GP2 this year with a brand new team in Russian time so I didn't really know what to expect I was thrilled to be racing but uh, very much going into the unknown I hadn't driven a GP2 car for well over a year hadn't driven anything for probably four or five months uh, so kind of you know thrown into the deep end as it were however it's uh, it's worked out pretty well you won at Monaco this year, but wasn't it not for the second straight year that you won there? It's, what is it about Monaco that you know brings your drive out to its best? I don't know. I, I really enjoy the whole atmosphere. I love driving that circuit. I like the fact that uh, I feel comfortable there. I feel comfortable with the walls being able to push right to its limit. Mm -hmm. I've qualified on pole twice there, got many fastest laps and won twice there. So it is a good circuit for me. So what was it like to win your home GP? Amazing. Amazing to win at Silverstone in front of my home crowd, um, in front of everybody, you know, fr friends and family, was was just awesome. I've got to say, but to lead it pretty much from start to finish as well and command the race from from the offset felt very very good. Uh, so, what has been your favourite track to drive this year? I mean, my personal favourite is Spa. What's your favourite track to go on? Well, Formula One is blessed with the fact that it can choose the best tracks. Um, I've never been to Singapore before. Very much enjoyed that. Uh, I think I've won it the best track so far this year. I was disappointed not to win at Monza, came second there. Uh, in my opinion, should have won had it not been for a poor pit stop. But, uh, you know, to win at Bahrain, Silverstone, uh, Singapore, Spa and Monaco, I mean, those are, those are five pretty cool tracks in my opinion. You said that you work for Mercedes as a test driver, third driver. What, what do your weekends involve? Well, I go to every single race as backup, basically, for Lewis and Nico in case they were unwell or unable to drive for whatever reason. I could jump in the car and do the best job I can. Uh, I'm prepared mentally, physically, uh, and also I've done all the preparation work in the simulator that's prepared me for every eventuality. How many hours weekly might you actually spend in a uh, simulator? Well, I'll be there at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> until 7 o'clock at night and uh, also Thursday as well so you know twice three times a week I'll be on the simulator working on the next event or the event after also working on a lot of 2014 stuff at the moment as well as you can imagine. So when you get called to a race you were called to Japan, Korea, when there's no GP2 on is it a bit of a boring weekend sometimes? I might drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> it seems understandable because staring at timesheets all day might be a tad boring. Well I feel a part of the team because I've done all the preparation work I feel like what I've done is going into Lewis and Nico's efforts. So I will, you know, listen intently to the radio, um, maybe make some comments in the debriefs about uh, curse deployments or ratios or, or, or whatever it might be, for example, on the car. So I do feel a part of the team, even though I'm not necessarily doing very much. So what are the engineers looking from you when you do the young driver's tests and test runs throughout the year? Mainly to obviously be quick in consistency. You know, they, they don't want someone to do one lap quick and then one lap slow, then one lap okay. They want repetitiveness so that they can look at the data and see a consistent gain or, um, or not, as the case may be, with a new component. You know, they've done all this aero work in the tunnel, um, CFD work. Um, they might think that it's worth a couple of points of downforce, a new, a new component on the car. So I've got to prove that that part works or doesn't work. So it's up to me to be consistent and quick with, uh, with the car that they give me. The steering wheel in a Formula 1 car is a lot more complicated than the GP. Do you think they're too complicated? Or? Uh, you, you, you know, people that are watching this at home might look at a Formula 1 steering wheel and go, what the, what oh, the hell are all these yeah. buttons? <laughs> but for me, it's, um, how can I put it? It's a little bit like if, if anybody is in their road car and they want to change the track on, on the stereo um, 
then they want to turn the volume up and do the windscreen wiper, but they also want to turn right at the same time. You know, doing all those things is very, very easy if you know your road car. I know my steering wheel. So it, it's just like those controls, but at 200 miles an hour. Obviously, because it's Mercedes, it is a big team. What's it like being part of a big team? You know? yeah, amazing. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot over the years with Nico, Lewis and, and Michael Schumacher. I've, I've learned off three brilliant drivers, also some brilliant engineers as well, some of the best in, in the business, um, being under, under Ross's, uh, you know, banner is, is a pretty cool place to be. He's, he's been there and done it all. Uh, same with Jeff Willis, same with Bob Bell, Aldo Costa. Um, they've all been there and done it. So it's pretty cool to learn off those guys. Um, and I feel ready now to make the next step in my career, which would be to race in a Formula 1 race. So do you feel that you still need to prove yourself to Formula 1 teams, or do you think that you've done enough? Um, the proof that I want to do now is obviously proof that I can race well. Um, I can test well, obviously. I believe that I will be able to race well, given the opportunity. Well, there will be seats available next year. A lot of GP2 drivers obviously going to Formula 1 and Adam Erdo, Perez and Perez. There's plenty you can name. Where do, you, do you feel like you have a good enough chance to get into one of these teams? I feel, yeah. I, I don't see any reason why not. I, I believe that with what I've done over the last two or three years in a senior single-seater category, mm -hmm. um, that I've done enough to prove that I can, I can cope with Formula One. You know, um, not only on, on track but off track as well. I believe that I'm mentally stable enough to, to cope with all the pressures that come with it but also deliver on the track as well. But if Formula One isn't available to you, would you consider maybe going to America and doing IndyCar at all? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think that that's the pinnacle in, in America. They look like great cars, they get some great attendances. Um, so I definitely think that if, if F1 was not an opportunity, the likes of DTM and IndyCar would be, uh, would be just as appealing, really. Okay. Well, I think I only have one more question. If you was the F1 star in a racing class car, could you go quickest? Of course, of course. You've got to believe in your That's ability, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I'm lighter than all the rest, so yeah, I've got a weight advantage. Okay. If Jeremy Clarkson wants to give me that chance, <laughs> I'm more than happy to try and display it. Okay, well, I think I am happy. Yes. Brilliant. Thank anyway, thank you very much indeed. And you can see the full version of that interview on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash britsonpole, as well as the full version of the one with Duncan Tappy. That's all for this edition. Um, please uh, subscribe to us on YouTube so you get notified of when the next one comes up. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye.